Okay, um, I think we'll get started now. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome to today's discovery session. These sessions are meant to support students, businesses, and other organizations with an understanding of how to use data and artificial intelligence. But before we get into it, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that DeepSense works out of Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship. We'd like to recognize the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. We want to ask that everyone take a moment to consider the territory in which they're situated and their own personal responsibility in the processes of reconciliation. So hi everyone, my name is Alyssa and I'm the communication specialist with DeepSense. For those of you that don't know what DeepSense is, let me give you a little bit of an introduction. DeepSense is a project based out of Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, but we work with universities and colleges across Atlantic Canada. We work with companies in the ocean sector who are interested in harnessing the potential of data and creating a smarter ocean economy. We connect these companies with the next generation of AI, machine learning, and the and data expert, aka you, you students. Uh, we work with companies to create a project that best suits their needs, and then we find a researcher and a student to help execute the project as either a master's research project, a co-op, or an internship. We've had past projects in data analytics, data collection, data visualizations, data cleaning and processing, and of course, AI and machine learning. Projects could be anything from creating a deep learning model to track fish, or creating a prediction model for safe navigation in the Halifax Harbor, or even a computer model that can identify whale shapes from aerial images. If you've ever wanted to grow your skills and work on real projects and gain industry experience, then make sure you submit your information to our student pool. Projects and internships and co-ops pop up throughout the year, so it's useful to throw your name in there because it's the first place that we'll check to, fill, uh, to find someone to fill a position. I'll share the link uh, for the pool in the chat right now. Um, and make sure that your resume is rocking and a tip top shape because you wanna stand out since only those who are selected for an interview will be contacted. Now for today's session, we'll be discovering Cove's Stella Maris testing solution, a platform that provides an avenue for research and development of marine sensors and technologies. Cove's Stella Maris testing solution is a unique test bed for marine instrumentation located at Cove in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. With a subsea platform, a dockside testing area, shoreside operations center, and 24-hour access to the data portal, Stella Maris Testing Solution offers everything a marine technology company needs to conduct product development, verification, and commercialization to advance innovation. Stella Maris Testing Solution offers a robust, secure, and adaptive platform to support a range of sensor types, such as acoustic, optical, chemical, and biological. Let's dive into how Stella Mars Testing Solution works, what it offers, and how it helps with ocean technology innovation. And to introduce us to Stella Mars, we have Riley Kennedy, the database steward for Cove Stella Mars Testing Solution, and he's also our database administrator here at DeepSense. At Cove, Riley's responsible for managing and maintaining Stella Mars Testing Solution database, ensuring smooth backups and recovery operations, monitoring performance, and troubleshooting any issues that may arise. Riley gained marine experience aboard vessels with Atlantic Towing and Clearwater Seafoods, as well as the Coriolis II, a Canada research vessel. He has been involved in sample collections and seismic surveys around the coast of Nova Scotia, the Magdalen Islands, and the St. Lawrence River. Riley graduated with a diploma in marine navigation from the Nova Scotia Community, er, Community College Marine Institute and a diploma in database administration. And if you have any questions throughout the presentation, we'll be taking them at the end, but feel free to drop them in the chat at any point as they come up, or you can use the question and answer box, or you can go ahead and unmute and ask your question at the end. And that is more than enough from me. Let's hear from Riley. Thanks, Alyssa. And now I'll just share my screen. We'll get started. So I'm assuming you can see this. Okay, uh, yeah, so Stella Maris. Um, first, I'm going to get started by going over what, we're gonna, what I'm going to cover today. So first, I'm going to introduce Cove, um, and then I'll get into the Stella Maris hardware or physical infrastructure, um, and then go into the data, 
infrastructure, which again is what I take care of. And then we talk about some of the use cases of companies that we've had on uh, platform. So if you haven't heard about Cove, Cove is the Center for Ocean Ventures and Entrepreneurship. It's a world leading innovation hub and technology center with a mission to create the world's next practical, commercial, and revolutionary tech advances in the marine sector. So Cove was established in 2016, I believe it was a Dahavi subsidiary, and then it was moved to this site um, in 2018, which the site is the old Coast Guard uh, location. So Cove brings people together, um, it brings together people, ideas, and technology across the marine sector in both Canada and internationally. So they invest in shared ocean infrastructure to deliver access to best in class data and insights. So again, uh, the Cove facility, high tech innovation hub uh, for global defense, security, offshore energy, fisheries, aquaculture, marine transportation, tourism sectors. Um, they have a facility, Cove facilities, technology programs and services help innovators commercialize, advance their product and services. And Cove is home to more than 65 local global and marine technology businesses, startups, researchers, and serves and service businesses. Uh, with over 200 organizations participating in programs and services, Cove engages in global network of 3,000 companies, uh, of companies, academic institutions, and government partners. Um, Cove is also a nonprofit, or sorry, a nonprofit um, that is funded through private investment through our founding partner, Urban Shipbuilding, which was, our contract with them was just renewed uh, for five years, as well as federal and provincial funding support for our missions and programming. So our mandate or Cove's mandate is uh, to focus on addressing barriers to commercialization of the ocean, of ocean technology. So Cove is located in, uh, on the Halifax Harbor um, on the, Dartmouth Wharf. Uh, it's an eight-acre eight site of 12-acre water lot and 2,850 feet of uh, dock space, including two finger piers for vessels to tie up, uh, with up to 49 feet of water depth and 5, or 50,000 square feet of office and workshop space. So Cove offers a number of programs and services um, from facilities and dockyards to test and validate, which is uh, what I'll be talking about today with Stella Maris, um, work and learn, uh, incubate, accelerate, research, commercialize, hub and spoke, uh, reports and insights. I'm gonna touch on these programs and services um, a little bit today, but if you wanna find out more, you can always go to Cove's website at coveocean.com. So facilities and dockyard, uh, Cove has office space um, for rent. So there's office and workshop spaces, uh, which include private offices and access to all the shared amenities at Cove, uh, including meeting, meeting rooms, workshops, and on-water project areas. Uh, they also have communal desk space um, and of course the dockyard space. And test and validate, we have uh, our Cove's latest project, which is Digital Harbor. Uh, I'm not going to speak on that today, but it's another project that I work on. And if you want to find out more about that, there's a deep sense discovery session on Digital Harbor as well. Uh, they also maintain uh, the Smart Atlantic buoy, which is located in the mouth of the harbor. Um, and today we have the Selmaris testing solution, which I'll talk about more in a bit. So they also have uh, work and learn. Uh, programs and services um, with their internship program. So if you're a student, highly recommend uh, applying for that for the summer. Um, you can get placed with one of the great companies here at Cove. Uh, they're also facilitated with the Ocean Institute and they provide educational workshops and they have incubate and accelerate programs uh, with an accelerator program and startup yard, as well as the I can't pronounce that word. I'm not gonna try, so I don't botch it. Um, so in the research in commercialized uh, programs and services, we have, of course, DeepSense. Um, and then there is the 
modular ocean research infrastructure, and we are also partnered with NCC SeaTac. Uh, for hub and spoke, there's the Atlantic Northeast Marine Innovation Corridor. Uh, we have a memorandum understanding with Norway and Rostock. And for reports and insights, um, Co produces the Canadian Ocean Enterprise White Paper, as well as uh, Nova Scotia's opportunity for marine electrification. And there's an article on of Cove's best on the Blue Economy students, student thoughts report on high school students in Ontario. So just to show you some of the companies, just to show you some of the companies here at Cove, we have SMEs, uh, we have startup companies, uh, some of our global companies include Collinsburg and Lloyd's Registry. Uh, our clusters, government partnerships, our other partners, including DeepSense, and our education partners as well. And some of the notable events at Cove in the last six months, we host a lot of delegations um, for, from people all over the world. World. So we had the president of Iceland here, um, Innovation Norway, um, yeah, German de delegation. So lots of people come to visit Cove. Sweet. So moving on to the Stellaris testing solution, uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, physical infrastructure to start. So Stellaris um, is a subsea platform. So it was developed to promote technology and innovation in the marine sector, and it provides companies an affordable and accessible location to conduct product development, verification, and commercialization to help get their products and sensors to market factor faster. So Stellamaris was launched in May of 2021 as a subsea platform. Uh, it was deployed 100 meters off of Cove's Wharf's Edge, and it consisted of 17 different oceanographic instruments from various companies and displays real-time data. So the real-time data and communication allows for companies to adjust their sensors and configuration without physically removing it from the marine environment. Um, the platform, wait, the, I don't know if that muted it for you guys, but um, the real-time data and communication allows for companies to adjust their sensors, configurations. Um, we do a deployment cycle of three months in the water, and then we take it out of water for a one-week recovery for maintenance. Um, so approximately four deployments, uh, four deployment cycles each year. Sorry. Um, so this is a technical drawing of the Selmaris um, multi-sensor CBID platform. Um, each sensor is attached to the aluminum frame by a Delrin bracket. Um, one unique thing about these brackets is they're used to hold the sensors and they are easily adjustable or removable uh, subsea. So should any sensor need to be changed or removed underwater, we can do that without having to recover the platform. Uh, with the use of divers to go down and um, disassemble those. So Stella was created with collaboration with over 30 different companies here at Cove, um, some of them providing oceanographic instruments, some of them technical support and operational support. Um, here I've outlined uh, some of the companies that had, had a major role um, in the launch of Stellamar's platform. Um, so yeah, some of these providing uh, sensors, some of them helping with the design. So some of the sensors on the platform, uh, we have reference sensors. So these are sensors that Cove owns and companies can use the data from these sensors to uh, facilitate their own testing to make sure that their products are performing as intended. Um, so first we have CTDs, so connectivity, temperature, depth, um, which is a standard ocean parameter measurement. Um, so two companies with CTDs on the platform, we have AML Oceanographic and RBR. Um, CTDs are also used to measure salinity of the water. 
Uh, so for water clarity, we have dubidity and chlorophyll. That's from Zeos Technologies. And we have a number of different hydrophones. So hydrophones from Ocean Sonics, Turbulent Research, and Sensor Technology, as well as dissolved CO2 from Pro Oceanus and subsea camera, two subsea cameras from one's a OTAC and the other one is a deep sea power and light. So some of the clients that we've had on Stella is uh, Dartmouth Ocean Technologies phosphate sensor. So using their unique lab on a chip technology, the sensor is able to determine phosphate concentrations uh, present in the water column. Uh, we've also had Sedna's technology, uh, the sensor globe, which is used to monitor water quality for fish populations as they travel from production to market. Um, and Kraken Sea Vision, which is a 3D image imager that is used to assess the amount of biofouling degradation of materials on item subsea. We also have the Marine Canary by Degacy, which is a biological sensor um, that uses muscles uh, to detect abnormalities in the ocean environment, I suppose. Um, if you want to learn more about the Integracy, I'm going to talk about it a little bit later on, but if you want to have a deeper dive, you can go into a uh, deep sense discovery session on that. And we also have the C-STAB, which is developed by Ingenuity, and this is our uh, lifting device that we use to take Stella in and out of the water. Um, I'll show you in a second, but there's a orange cone on Stella that the C-STAB C -stab goes into uh, and has a quick release, so we're able to deploy it from just a crane. Um, yeah, so we don't have to go down and, dis and unattach that. Uh, uh, yeah. Unattach the lift, so it has a quick release, so we're able to just pull a kind of a wire rope and the, the leave the platform on the bottom. Cool thing about this is we're also able to attach it to the platform while it's sub C, so we can use an ROV um, to rig that up and take the platform out of the water. So we don't need the use of to hire divers again to uh, go and rig that up. So some of the lessons learned that we've learned uh, over the past two years with Stella is um, we've evolved Stella to become a Stella Nurse testing solution. So before, it, the main focus was really the subsea platform. But after talking and engaging with companies at different development stages, uh, we learned that, especially in the early stages, um, companies with prototypes or few instruments, they have a hard time committing to placing their sensor on the platform for the three months that we were deployments that we were doing before. Um, so that's why we evolved it into this testing solution. So we've now made a dockside testing station, which I'll show you a picture later. Um, but essentially it's a cage against the wharf and companies can rent that out instead of the platform. And we're also renting out the shoreside operation center. Um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Um, so yes, part of the solution, they have access to the real-time data coming off of their sensors. Um, so this is our container or the Stella Maris Operation Center um, located at the Cove's Wharf Edge. Uh, this gives you access to um, internet. Uh, there's rentable desks in there. Uh, of course, water access. There's lots of tools in there available. Um, and the container is climate controlled. So there's heat and AC, uh, which is very key in the winter and summer months in Nova Scotia. Um, so yes, this is the dockside testing solution, ideal for short deployments. So two, two to five days, depending on uh, what a company needs, we can be more adaptive to their needs with this solution. So still allows for real-time data collection. Um, we can grab the water column instead of just the, yeah, instead of just the stationary testing. Um, and it's easier to access uh, for daily oceanographic devices. Um, yeah, fully integrates with the 
Operations Center. So a little bit more about the platform. We've changed things up to do uh, year-long deployments now um, for clients to collect long-term uninterrupted data. Um, so this provides companies an accessible way to get a long-term testing and data set for, of their product and really see how it performs um, in the harsh ocean environment over a long period of time. So some of the benefits of Stella, uh, Stella gives companies a horrible way to collect large long-term data sets. Um, data sets are beneficial for demonstrating sensor reliability. Um, and this provides companies with exposure to the marine tech community. Um, and that can lead to potential collaboration with other companies and their devices. So getting into Stella Maris's, uh data infrastructure, um, this is really my sort of focus. Um, so starting off, we have a network diagram. On the left is our server rack, and the diagram represents what is going on in this rack. Um, so this is located inside that operation center. Um, at the top of our rack, at the top of the rack, we have a uh, McCartney multiplexer. So this supplies power and communications to the platform and to the sensors. Um, so for anybody that doesn't know what a multiplexer does, it essentially takes uh, multiple input signals and routes them, routes those several signals onto one output signal. Um, so say like if this was the top side unit, we are sending power and different communications to all the sensors. So that goes onto one line that would go to the platform where there's another multiplexer there. So that communication gets demultiplexed and all those communications get routed to the correct sensors and uh, provides power to those sensors as well. Um, so this is how we communicate with the platform. Um, this allows for bi-directional data routing or full duplex, uh, meaning that data can flow to and from the platform simultaneously. Uh, we use a fiber optic cable for that one um, output channel, or I guess two fiber optic channels two, yeah, two fiber optic channels because you can only go one way with them. Um, so yeah, the nice thing about the multiplexer, it allows us to control the power individually to each sensor. So if a sensor is um, having some trouble, we're able to just turn it off without it having uh, effect to any of the other sensors. Um, next in that unit, we have the versatile power supply. So this is what is powering up the, this is what's supplying power to the multiplexer. And we supply uh, 240 volts to the platform. Um, and then below that, we have some of our networking devices. So Ubiquiti router, this is our security device. You know, it's the firewall, um, allows me VPN access into the network. Uh, uh yeah and as well as a serial hub so this essentially takes serial connections and output or yeah i guess outputs it onto a tcp ip address so a lot of our sensors have serial connections um and after they go through the multiplexer yeah so if you see the diagram that red line from the serial hub to comparing your MUX represents that those cables are plugged into the MUX uh, VIA serial. But for me to get the data from those sensors, uh, the serial hub is also attached to the switch um, by an Ethernet cable. So when I connect to the sensors, I'm essentially going to their IP address and port number. Um, this just makes it easier to manage all those sensors. Um, and yeah, so in the rack, we also have a processing server and a database server. So on the processing server, we are running a database called Postgres. Uh, I'll talk about that more in a minute. And we're also using uh, Grafana as that web uh, data portal. And there's also Wi-Fi access in the uh, container, like I mentioned before.
So for storage on the platform, uh, on those two servers, they're two Linux servers. So we use the Zettabyte file system or ZFS. Um, if you've ever heard of the Windows equivalent of a RAID array, this is essentially uh, that, but for Linux. Uh, so it's, a, it's an advanced file system. Uh, and ZFS can create a file system that spans across a series of drives and create a pool. So you can add storage to a pool by adding another drive and ZFS will handle that partitioning and formatting. Um, so if you look in the top right, you'll see a diagram with many disks. So essentially these are hard drives. <clears throat> um, and these disks can be separated into different virtual, uh, I forget the name for it, but essentially virtual disks, um, which goes into a ZFS pool. So if you, on your Windows or Mac computer, plug in another hard drive and you go to the file manager, you see that that's a separate drive. ZFS can, you can have many, many uh, different disks, but the server will just read it as if it's one disk. Mm -hmm. So this is a pretty cool technology. So you can set it up, you can configure it in a few different ways. So uh, the way I've done it is, um, processing server because we have only two 1.7 terabyte uh, drives. I've set it up into a ZFS mirror. So whenever we write data to those drives, it essentially writes to both the disks and keeps a copy on both of them. Whereas in the database storage, uh, we have seven 12 terabyte drives. Uh, this is our database server. Um, so I set this up with a ZFS RAID Z2, which I believe is the equivalent to like uh, RAID Array 6 or something. Um, so this essentially writes the data to all of those drives. Um, uh, Yeah, so it writes, it keeps copies of the data on multiple drives and essentially allows us to, if I was to lose two disks, I would still have all of our data. Whereas with the mirrored version, if you lose one disk, you still have the other copy. Um, ZFS also does some compression when storing data, so it helps save on storage as well. You do lose, um, you do lose storage, setting these up in mirror and, uh, like uh, and the raids that do, but the redundancy is worth it. So for cell, we use Postgres. Uh, Postgres is a relational database. Um, it's open source, so it helps keep our costs low. Um, this is a screenshot of PG Admin, uh, which is the client that you use to connect to Postgres. Um, each data frame, or yeah, each data line here um, is timestamped. Uh, so this is the AML CTD, and you timestamp these in UTC. Originally, when I first came on the project, we were timestamping with local time, uh, but I realized that Grafana automatically when it's querying your database, switches the time into your time zone. So it's essentially changing our data from our local time and sending it like four hours ahead. So it wasn't really displaying correctly in Grafana. Um, and yeah, so CTDs can sample at six times a second. So these tables tend to grow very, very quickly, I believe. After two years, this table's at 100 million rows, uh, which is a lot of time series data for a relational database to deal with, um, which relational databases aren't the best at dealing with time series data because they grow so quickly and because there's not really an ID to um, index that database with. So indexing a database is um, is how you would speed up database performance 
but it doesn't really work with time series data because of that time series uh, being your ID. So indexing a database is essentially the same as when you look into the back of a book and you look at the index there. So there might be some words with the page number. Um, in database, it'd be, you'd be looking for, you'd be querying the database, so looking for a certain ID, and it would tell you, it would tell you where that ID is so that your database can retrieve faster. Um, yeah, so to combat this, and something that I've learned uh, while working here, is a plugin called TimescaleDB. Um, it is essentially a Postgres extension. Um, it runs within a Postgres server as part of the same process. So any operations run in Postgres are first processed by TimescaleDB, um, determine how they should be planned or executed. Uh, you don't really notice the install, you still have full SQL functionality. Um, and the core feature of TimescaleDB is hypertables. So hypertables will automatically partition that time series data uh, into smaller chunks based on the specific time intervals. And these chunks are stored in separate tables or hypertables um, for, and is managed by time scale DB. So when data is inserted into the database, um, it's inserted into a hypertable. So if so timescale DB will check the timestamp as you're in of the data that you're inserting. And if that timestamp doesn't match with um, the current chunk that's made, uh, timescale DB will automatically create a new chunk. So very little to manage with timescale DB. Um, then when you go to exit, yeah, then when you go to query the database, um, timescale DB takes a little bit more time to plan and execute that query. Um, but because it's looking, taking that time range that you specified in a query, and it's able to find the hyper table where that data is stored, um, it's able to greatly increase the speed of uh, Postgres. Um, so the right image there uh, is taken right from TimeScale's DB's website, I believe the blog post demonstrating their speed. So the query that would go in and grab 33 million rows of data uh, from a 100 million row uh, table is essentially five times faster than just regular Postgres creating a table. Um, so I believe, yeah, when I was testing this, it, it basically 10x the speed of uh, my database. So if anybody is dealing with time series data, I highly recommend uh, time scale DB. It also does, uh, it also helps with uh, storage of data. So keeping like the storage resources lower, which is really helpful if you're running an AWS instance of a database, uh, you can't install it on the serverless AWS uh, services that are managed by AWS, but if you do have a database on like EC2 instance, then you can install time to scale DB uh, on it. So this is our Grafana instance. Um, this is our real-time data portal. Uh, Grafana does a good job of visualizing data. It connects directly to that Postgres instance um, and users are able to have credentialed access and also personalized dashboards for themselves that they don't want anybody else to see. So there's lots of roles and permissions um, within Grafana. Um, it's also able to send me alerts when there is no data coming from a sensor. So I know exactly when something stopped working. Um, it also has another cool, uh, I guess you'd say, yeah, partner plugin is Prometheus. Um, so where Grafana connects to, or well, where I'm using Grafana to connect to Postgres database with, uh, 
oceanographic instruments, data stored there. Uh, Prometheus is able to query uh, log files. So you're able to query server metrics, and I use it for monitoring the performance of our servers as well. So getting into some of the companies that we've had um, on the platform, I'm going to start with Integracy and then move on to Ryzen side. So Integracy was co-founded by Ulrich Lobster and Lawrence Taylor. Uh, Ulrich has 35 years of practical and executive experience in the oceanography and instrument method development. Um, so he pioneered a smart deep sea camera called the Deep Slope back in the early 80s. Uh, the camera was configured with time lapse and event sensor capabilities. And Lawrence is an, a, an experienced biologist, underwater researcher, and filmmaker who recently delved into advanced automated vision technologies and machine learning. So using both their photography backgrounds, Ulrich and Lawrence developed the first version of the Marine Canary. So its purpose is to be an early warning system for waterborne hazards for marine and human life. Um, so named after the canary in a coal mine, which if you don't know, the British used canaries uh, as an early warning system for detection for carbon monoxide and other toxic gases in coal mines. So the marine canaries, quite simply, um, an underwater camera pointed at some muscles that are glued to popsicle sticks. Um, oh, sorry, a time lapse uh, camera system. Um, so currently, the camera is only able to shoot during daylight hours. Um, but I know that Integracy is partnered up with students from the NSCC CTEC program to develop an infrared system, so to allow more <clears throat> recording during the night to collect more data. Um, so essentially, they want to monitor if muscles are opening and closing to monitor the behavior. Um, so to do that, they would have to go and look through hours and hours and hours of uh, time-lapse footage of these muscles and kind of develop a system of to see, or like a rating to see like if they're open or closed. Um, so instead of doing that, they partnered with DeepSense to build a compute, uh, computer vision model. Um, so DeepSense provided them with an intern, and this intern made some major improvements uh, over the manual version that they were doing, and made a computer vision model that had about a 91.6 success rate. Uh, I've heard that it's more accurate with the top six muscles than the bottom three. Um, but that might be because of different light differences from the camera. The other company I want to talk about is uh, Rising Tide. So Rising Tide is a bioacoustics uh, company. So utilizing proprietary unique underwater acoustic speakers to provide solutions for fish deterrence and guidance, environmental friendly methods of improving the efficiency and reducing bycatch of commercial vessel, commercial fishing operations, as well as noise cancellation system for uh, commercial vessels. Um, and a way to control and eradicate the invasion of uh, invasive species. So their ongoing development, um, they're a startup company. Um, but they were renting out cell mirrors for testing out their cancellation algorithm. So using the hybrid phones on the Stella, they um, yeah, they were essentially uh, using a cancellation algorithm that can handle multiple tones and automatically adjust for different changes in frequency and amplitude. Um, so Stella helped them save tens of thousands of dollars uh, and allow them to make quicker and better progress uh, and meet their project objectives with a smaller budget, as well as being able to, part of that process was uh, obviously testing, but also doing a demonstration to uh, Transport Canada. So 
they're in the process now of developing acoustic technology, uh, fish deterrence and guidance, and environmental monitoring, and invasive species control. Yeah. Um, they haven't been to Stella in a bit, but I'm interested to see how their research is going. If you see in the picture on the right there, that is an acoustic, uh, an older acoustic device, and the technology has certainly improved with becoming a lot smaller and more manageable for vessels. So very promising technology. Um, definitely keep an eye out for them. But yeah, this was my last slide. So if you have any interesting, or if you have any, or if you want to learn more, you can go to coocean.com um, to learn more about our programs and services. Thank you so much, Riley. That was really interesting. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? If not, I know I have lots of questions, but I'd like to hear if our audience members have any questions. You're welcome to unmute or pop the question in the chat. Okay, none so far. Okay, so I have a question about um, the last project, the Rising Tides project that you talked about. Um, so I, it's more about how it will affect like echolocation. So if those transmitters are transmitting sort of like a white noise, like how you explained it to me earlier, how kind of like white noise or um, noise canceling headphones work. Do you know how that affects echolocation for whales? I have no idea. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> um, and on the whale topic, um, on the hydrophones that you have running, do you ever pick up like whale noises or any kind of like marine life noises? Um. No, it's very hard uh, to hear that because of all of the ship noise right. in the harbor. You can hear, yeah. Uh, even though the hydrophones are very sensitive, uh, I haven't been able to hear anything with that. I've heard like helicopters and uh, I think construction noise on King's Wharf. Right. Yeah. So if he's asking if it's only ship noise or if you. Get other yeah. kind of noise, yeah. Only ship noise is what I've been able to detect. Right. Um, what about any kind of cool marine life on those subsea cameras? Uh, we've had different types of crabs and fish, yeah. Okay, that's fun. <laughs> yeah. It's always very surprising when you turn the camera on and see something crawling on the <laughs> platform. Um, and I have one more question. Um, so if those, so I'm assuming those sensors on the platform that Cove has it, are, those are running continually, continually, right? Yeah. Fully running. Unless it's out of the water. Yeah. So okay. Basically 24 seven. Yeah. Um, so what happens with all of that data? Like, are you guys kind of housing it or is it like open source? Um, for the reference sensors, uh, it's not open source, but it's open to other companies that are renting out the platform. Right. Uh, that's something we're considering in the future is maybe making that open source, uh, but not at this time. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's stored inside the operation center. Right. Um, and companies have access to it through the web. Cool. Any other questions from our audience? Okay, well, if that's everything, I think we're going to wrap up, unless you have any other last words, Riley. Uh, no, that's that's enough for me. All righty, I'm just going to drop some links in the chat here for our student pool and some other things we have going on at Deep Sense. Um, so thank you again so much for taking time out of your busy day to join us. Um, I've dropped some links in the chat for our student pool and also our mentorship program, STEM Connector, which is a flash mentorship program that if you're interested in connecting with folks working in the ocean sector or connecting with other students like yourselves, um, it's free to sign up. It's a flash mentorship program, so you can, you can connect with lots of different mentors 
And it's more one-off meetings that can be done virtually or in person, whatever works best for you. And if you enjoyed today's discovery session, we have lots of other discovery sessions available on our YouTube channel. So the link for that is also in the chat um, as well. And I dropped all of our social media links in there as well. And keep an eye out for more discovery sessions and events from us in the new year. Um, thanks again, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. And we'll see you at the next discovery session. Bye. Thank you.